My name is uh, James Weaver, um, and um, <laughs> and uh, how do you say? Um, and this is oh, and this, this is Sandhya Kapoor. Yes, yes. And oh, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. So, um, uh, who doesn't speak uh, Dutch? Okay, you don't. Julie, do you? This is my wife here. Do you speak Dutch? No, she doesn't. So, so that everybody can understand me, I'm going to switch to English, if that's okay. I'll do that. Okay, very good. Um, and uh, so, Sandra Kap Sandra Kapoor, I'll let her introduce herself. Uh, she's a senior software engineer with, um, uh, with IBM, and um, she's the real, kind of the, she's going to, I'm opening for her, right? So, so anyway, I'm going to speak for 25 minutes. I'm starting here. And uh, I did want to introduce my wife. Uh, if you'll stand up, uh, this is Julie Weaver. We've been married for 41 years this November. Turn around, so wave to the crowd. Everybody, this is Julie. Julie, this is everybody. Uh, this is just a picture of our morning walk in, in beautiful uh, Fenendal and, uh, of course, uh, Ada. Um, about me, I've written uh, several Java books, JavaFX books, uh, a Raspberry Pi book of late. Um, I'll let uh, Sanja uh, talk about herself. And uh, yesterday we did a workshop. Uh, so if you, uh, if you go to my Twitter account, which is JavaFExpert, uh, my latest tweet is actually a tweet to these slides. Um, and when you get to these slides, um, about five or six slides in, there's a, a slide here where you can click here to see my part of this talk. And that'll take you to this slide, which, which we're going to dive into machine learning. And Sandhya is going to dive into kind of the, uh, the larger area of cognitive computing. So uh, first, to introduce this, I wanted to... Um, to play an, uh, an introduction to a course that Andrew Eng uh, created uh, with Coursera. He actually founded or co-founded Coursera, but he also does a great machine learning course. Has anybody ever heard of Andrew Eng or taken this course, started the course, and not finished it? Very good. So, um, so take it away, uh, Andrew. One intelligent machines, which Whoops. can do just about anything that you I'll want. I'll let Andrew start from the beginning. What is machine learning? You probably use it dozens of times a day without even knowing it. Each time you do a web search on Google or Bing, that works so well because their machine learning software has figured out how to rank web pages. When Facebook or Apple's photo application recognizes your friends and your pictures, that's also machine learning. Each time you read your email and a spam filter saves you from having to wade through tons of spam, Again, that's because your computer has learned to distinguish spam from non-spam email. So that's machine learning. It's a science of getting computers to learn without being explicitly programmed. Okay, so I have a pop quiz early on. So somebody tell me, uh, just in your own words, what is machine learning? Somebody tell me. Raise your hand and shout it out. What is machine learning? Hint, it's on the slide. So just somebody tell me. Somebody read it. So what is machine learning? We can't go on until somebody tells me what machine learning is. Okay. Yes, what is machine learning, sir? It's learning itself. Okay. Yes. So if I wanted to give you a classic definition, you are correct. But I would say that machine learning is the science of getting computers to learn without being explicitly programmed. Okay, so the idea here is that as programmers, we uh, create algorithms to uh, to make a computer do something or to learn something. Um, but with machine learning, it's the science of getting a computer to do something without explicitly programming to do that thing. So it's learning, as you said. Very good. Um, so no more no more trick questions. One of the research projects that I'm working on is getting robots to tidy up the house. How do you go about doing that? Well, what you can do is have the robot watch you demonstrate the task and learn from that. The robot can then watch what objects you pick up and where to put them and try to do the same thing even when you aren't there. For me, one of the reasons I'm excited about this is the AI or artificial intelligence problem. 
building truly intelligent machines which can do just about anything that you or I can do. Many scientists think the best way to make progress on this is through learning algorithms called neural networks, which mimic how the human brain works. And I'll teach you about that too. In this class, you learn about machine learning and get to implement them yourself. I hope you sign up on our website and. So that's a very good course, and I do recommend it. It's 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 very good. Um, so what is machine learning? It's the science of getting computers to do to 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 learn things without explicitly programming them. There are three areas of machine learning. Uh, three, you can break it down into three categories. One is supervised learning, which I'll go into, um, uh, and uh, there's unsupervised learning, and then there's also uh, reinforced learning. But uh, in using those techniques, uh, you can uh, create things like you've seen before, like self-driving cars, uh, where the, the car drives itself through, uh, through supervised learning. As a matter of fact, if um, you know, the, the Tesla cars, anybody that owns a Tesla now, or a newer model, yes, you do, you own a Tesla. Come on down, yes, uh, yes. Um, so anybody that owns a Tesla car right now is actually, you are training uh, these, um, the, the future cars to drive because as you're driving your Tesla, it is, uh, it's, it's looking at the road, you know, there's a camera, cameras looking at the road, and as you are making, as you're steering it and avoiding obstacles or staying on the lines or whatever, it's noticing and recording how you're doing that, and um, and you are actually performing some supervised learning as well as other types of learning um, for for future. So you know, thousands and thousands of Tesla cars are actually simultaneously training um, now. Uh, so that's one application. Another one is generating image descriptions. So take an image uh, and use a neural network to be able to discover what's in that image and then go a step further um, and uh, create a narrative of you know what's happening in that image and then one step further even put it in some language so uh, uh, men in a black shirt playing a guitar that type of thing um, so that's um, those are some applications so the first major category is supervised learning supervised learning is this idea where um, you train it with the data set typically, or, uh, and um, in the data set you have inputs and outputs. So you have the inputs and then you have the correct answers. So for example, this is a, um, just kind of a classic uh, kind of machine learning problem, but it's very simple. It's, it's solved with uh, regression. It doesn't even require neural networks. So here we have, uh, on the x-axis, we have a house sizes in square meters. And then here we have price in euros. And so then we, we, um, uh, we have an X, Y, and we plot what the intersection of those are. And we notice those Xs, um, you could try to fit that with a straight line, but it's a better uh, fit with a curve. And so once we find a nice curve, then we could take a, a different house that we've never seen before, maybe 250 square meters and then f see that, okay, it's going to be worth about 150 uh, euros. And so with supervised learning, you're supplying the right answers. You're, applying, you're supplying features and the, the labels or the right answers. So then there's unsupervised learning, and that, that's where you have data sets, but you try to find things about the data without teaching it. You don't know beforehand. For example, you might want to see where the central features of the data are. Maybe uh, you have market segments and you're trying to discover where those, those uh, clusters are. So clustering algorithms. Um, then the third type is reinforcement learning. Uh, and reinforcement learning is this idea of, of where you have um, uh, an agent, a, uh, an agent that learns in its environment and based upon um, how many points it's getting, um, it, uh, it then is rewarded for learning more and more in the environment, and I'll go through examples of that. Um, so a re very recent example of reinforcement learning is this AlphaGo project by DeepMind, which was bought by Google, um, but the, uh, the Go program is a, uh, the Go board is a 19 by 19 board, that, uh, that is very complex, actually. The rules are simple, but it's a very hard game uh, to, to play well. And so 
um, you know, the AlphaGo through using reinforcement learning as well as um, some, some, supervised, some supervised and some neural networks uh, beat the, the top champion player. So I'd like to deep, I would like to now dive into supervised learning, that first category. So here's a classic supervised learning problem is the iris data set. So you have these flowers that have uh, four features. One is uh, the sepal length and width and one is the, uh, the petal length and width or height and width. And so on the right here, we see a table with those four features and the measurements, they're continuous values. And then we see the labels, which are, there are three species. And so these, this is a training data set then that has those features and those labels. And so there are, um, uh, there are about 150 rows in that data set. But the idea then is you can tr train a model and then you can pick a, another iris out of the field and then measure it and, and predict or classify what kind of iris it is. So the way that it does that, you know, if I've got four different features, then, then there are four different men dimensions that I need to compare against each other. So this chart shows the four different dimensions, and then it shows the, uh, a chart then, or a, a plot of, of, um, of those two dimensions against each other. And you can see how uh, in many cases, in most cases, there's a clear delineation of the boundaries between those. Those are called decision boundaries. So the machine learning algorithm needs to, in four dimensions, find the decision boundaries uh, for those. And that way, when we bring a new one in, it can compare and classify those. So, um, so it turns out, like in the, in the 1990s, um, as for, to... Uh, to further AI, one of the ideas that researchers had was to model the human brain. The problem was in the 1990s, Moore's law hadn't really caught up with what with the computing power that would be needed in terms of in terms of CPUs and uh, you know network bandwidth and uh, you know massive scaling uh, processing and and just things like that. So um, so it was a great idea, but it it kind of went out of favor for a while until a few years ago, um, and it came back into favor that, yes, we should model the human brain, um, or we should model uh, learning after the human brain. So this is the anatomy of an artificial neural network that, that is in use today. You've got an input layer that has features coming in, just like the iris data set. You have hidden layers, which, uh, which have weights and biases, which, which uh, are the qualities of this, this, uh, this, this brain. And then you've got the output layer, which are the labels or the, the things that you're trying to classify or predict. So I, um, in, in trying to learn about this stuff, I, I wanted to see the inner workings of a neural network. And so I created a program that would show me what's going on inside of a neural network. And on this slide, then you can just click these links and, and um, download with GitHub and build these programs and, and run them yourself if you'd like. But uh, I, ca I call it uh, neural net visualization. And I'll go ahead and um, run the, uh, the iris flower example. So here, when I hit iris flower, you'll notice that the, uh, that the weights and biases are updating. And so as the network is being trained, those weights and biases, those values are updating. Over here are the, th are the four input features, and over here are the three uh, uh, labels, the three species. And then here are different, uh, here are the two hidden layers with these activation functions in here. And so, going back to the presentation, um, if I want, if I see a new flower and I want to maybe um, enter its dimensions, I could enter enter them right here. I think you can see that. Yes, maybe those dimensions. I'll hit predict, and then it will run this calculation through the neural network uh, using these weights and biases. 
and it will come up with a prediction that yes, uh, 0.99 probability that that is an iris setosa. Uh, so, um, so that's how the prediction happens. And now what I'd like to do is you walk you through the, um, the calculations for that. By the way, this application is a single page HTML5 client. It, I'm using Angular 2 and VizJS. It's a visualization library. Um, but also, uh, um, I've created um, a Spring application that's running uh, on a server in, um, uh, that can run in Cloud Foundry if you want. Uh, but it's running locally on my, on my laptop right now that has um, web sockets and uh, a REST service. So the prediction when I, when I entered features in and predicted something that used the prediction REST service, when the model was being trained and you saw the numbers updated, uh, the reason why we could update those numbers on the, the server or the uh, client so quickly was because it was listening through a, a web socket. So Spring makes REST services and West, REST um, or WebSockets very easy to create. Um, they also, this application also uses this library called Deep Learning for J, and uh, this is the website, and you can click that, and there are lots of resources as far as um, uh, on deep learning, as far as uh, really nice libraries for implementing uh, deep learning kind of projects, uh, neural networks. Typically, uh, traditionally. Uh, machine learning has been done in Python, uh, but uh, with, li with libraries like this, uh, it's, it's really great uh, in Java to do that. Also, I mentioned Spring. If you go to start.spring.io, it's really easy to put together. Uh, you, you, you kind of pick the, the, the features that you want in your Spring application, and then it'll download a POM file and some starter applications. So it's, it's really nice that way. So here's a very simple neural network that, that, I, that I trained to do XOR logic. So everybody knows what XOR is. We're all programming. It's exclusive OR. So um, I'll go back to this example here and uh, click XOR. You notice it's trained now. And uh, so I'm going to say, well, true, uh, let's see, one, uh, true and f True X or false. What is true X or false? Somebody tell me. Exclusive or true X or false is? Yes, you are right. And so over here, we see that uh, it is true. So here we have uh, continuous values. They happen to be 0 and 1. But here we have something called a one-hot vector in which we have discrete classifications and the one that is predicted turns to one, and the one is the ones that aren't predicted turn to zero. So the the calculations that happen then, uh, as it goes through the network, is it goes it uh, with each node of the network, it multiplies that node's input by the weights. So for example, here if I were trying to calculate this one, uh, the value of this node, then I would take the, the input here, 1, times this weight, 8.54, and, and then I would take this input, 0, uh, times 8.55, which is 0, and add those, and I get 8.54. Then I add the bias, which is negative 3.99, and I get 4.55. So that gives me a number. But then I want to be able to... Um, convert that into this, what's called an activation function, which says whether that neuron fires or not. So there are several activation functions. The one that I'm using here is the sigmoid activation function. And that is a, a mathematical calculation of one over one plus e to the, um, to the negative power of whatever we calculated here. And that comes up with a 0.99. So we do that with all the the nodes in the network, it's a very quick operation, and that maps then inputs to outputs. Uh, the problem is, is that, uh, um, that the network has to be trained. So what we do is we uh, randomly assign values to these weights and biases, very low values, close to zero. And then during training, we take 
every row in that data set, we uh, use an input, we take the input value of the features, we run it through the feed forward, and then we find out what the answers are, and then we compare those with, with, with what the uh, answers really are in the data set. And then we do something called back propagation. Backwards through the network then, we uh, begin to change the numbers, the weights and biases, so that then over time, the, when we feed forward those values, the inputs, they get very close to what the outputs are. The difference is called the cost. And so during a, a learning algorithm, then you go through many iterations and as you're doing that, you're typically using something called gradient descent to then um, uh, descend this curve in which, and you're using this like partial derivatives to descend this curve and come up with uh, to where you're, um, uh, you're, you're minimizing your cost. You're minimizing that difference. And so this curve shows that, this, this graph, and so we're getting, we're trying to approach zero on our score. Um, so here's some typical output from, um, from that training. And um, then it gives you a score. It gives you some scores that have to do with accuracy and precision. And here's a link that gives you a Wikipedia link for, for that. Um, there's a great data set for uh, data scientists and people interested in machine learning. I went ahead and got a uh, data set for the fun of it called speed dating. Everybody familiar with speed dating, but you, uh, you know, in a, in a minute or two, you, uh, you sit across from someone uh, and uh, you find out about them and then you decide, do I want to go on a second date with that person? So there's a data set. That with Kaggle, where you can, where I downloaded it, and I isolated three features: attractive, intelligence, and fun, uh, that came from that data set. You know, did this person think the other person was attractive, intelligent, or and fun? And they rated those on one to ten, and then the labels, the output was, would I go on a date on, with that person again? And so uh, there are, you know, eight thousand some rows. I went ahead and created a neural network that, that, that does that in my example. And uh, that's right here. So that's the speed dating one. And you, again, you can run this. You can download and run this. But here's uh, the speed dating. And so I could say, well, you know, that person's um, uh, six in attractiveness, maybe nine in intelligence, and uh, uh, loads of fun, nine. And so we predict, and we notice that that, that because our culture values uh, attractiveness way more than intelligence, uh, sadly, um, that that person uh, actually uh, just barely got a second date. Now, here's the, here's the bad part about our culture, um, and this is universal. If I switch attractiveness and intelligence, then, yeah, for sure we want another date with that person. Uh, yeah, but beauty is only skin deep, right? So, so in Java, then, using the DL4J library, then here's how you would configure a, a speed dating neural network, giving it the layers, these, these two layers, and then telling it what the learning rate is and, and iterations and things like that. Um, so you can also, you know, we talked about uh, continuous input, the, the values are continuous in the input, and also well, the one-hot vectors on the output where they're discrete values, they're, you're classifying. You could also do that with, with um, uh, continuous output, like in regression sum. We could, uh, we could use that to calculate, to maybe add two numbers, like 2 plus you know, 1.2. And I could predict... Uh, training a neural network that that's uh, 3.2. But we're not, you know, there's no math engine in there. It's simply you've trained a neural network to do that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, you could also train a neural neck to play tic-tac-toe. And so the way that I did this was I took a client uh, developed in Java FX and uh, with this package called Glue on Mobile so that it would run on an iPad. 
and then I created a Java Spring REST microservice to take that input and then it sends that to this, uh, this neural network that I've, that I've created. The neural network has 27 nodes. The 27 nodes are actually nine one-hot vectors of, uh, of three nodes. And we represent an empty cell with, a one, with, with three nodes, one, uh, one, and then two zeros. The X is zero, one, zero, et cetera. So we have 27 of those here. Um, we have a hidden layer of just nine neural networks, or nine uh, nodes, and then we have an output layer of a one-hot vector with one, uh, with only one on, and that is what the neural network says that the player should play, that the computer should play. So here's the tic-tac-toe uh, training set. I basically took, um, I, I took some game theory and um, used a Minimax algorithm in game theory, if anybody's heard of that, to generate data, a data set that then would play perfect tic-tac-toe and can't lose. And so I'll end with this. I'll try to make this stop going. I'll end with this. Um, so we'll take that for a spin. And um, I think we've got that right here. I'll go ahead and hit refresh, and it's going to hit that web service and the neural network, and it's going to say, I'm going to um, actually go to the tic-tac-toe example here. There's the neural network, it's training it. And uh, as soon as it's done training it, then I'll be able to hit refresh. And so it says, okay, play X. Now, a human player, I might play here, and then it plays here, and then I block it, it plays here, it sets me up for the kill. I play here, and it wins. So anyway, that's, um, that's that. And the rest of this presentation, you can I've run out of time, but the rest of it deals with reinforcement learning and that whole issue. And um, uh, you can uh, take a look at some of the slides, and I'll be doing a presentation pretty soon on it, and I'll, I'll tweet the, uh, actually tweet the uh, resources so that you can see the video. So thank you very much for your attentiveness, and I'll give it to Sandhya. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sandhya, and uh, I work on a cool technology called Watson. But at the moment, my screen here is blank. So is there a reason why? <laughs> so uh, let's have an interactive session. Can you hear me? Um, so um, how many have heard of Watson? Awesome, awesome. So, uh, and how many uh, watched the video or seen Jeopardy um, when Watson won? Okay, great. So, um, at that time, uh, there was a deep QA architecture that was designed, um, and five years of research went into that. So, in that architecture, essentially, um, Watson learned 
how to uh, understand the question format that is put forward in Jeopardy, and then just crunch through the various databases for information to come out with an answer. Since then, the deep QA pipeline has changed because the um, kind of situations we want to deal with in AI has changed. So let's look at what advancements have we made since then uh, that have been accelerated by the deep learning neural networks. And some of the basics, thankfully, uh, Jim went through. I'm sure all of you enjoyed that. So um, what, is, what are the three things that are very critical now? Uh, one is reading comprehension. Uh, the other is looking at the knowledge base and reasoning with it. And then third is narration in human terms. So all these three things our brain does so efficiently. But how do AI systems do it? That's what we'll take a look at. And please feel free to ask questions or discussion, because that would help us make it interesting. So uh, let's first focus on reading comprehension. How does an AI system read and comprehend the natural languages? Uh, let's take an example. Uh, this is talking about UK exiting uh, the European Union. So the first question is very factual. But the next two questions, they do involve reasoning and thinking through. So how does an AI system do this? And by the way, Watson answered the next, all these three questions. So it does do the reading comprehension, curate the knowledge, and then give back an answer. So this is very promising. So how does this happen? Um, these days, we are using recurrent neural networks. So why recurrent? That is because it reiterates each task over and over and over. So what happens is, uh, let's say there is a paragraph. Super Bowl is very, very uh, famous and uh, enjoyable uh, in the US. So this is a paragraph about Super Bowl 50 being rigged, so very controversial. And the question asked is, who really did win the Super Bowl 50? So how does, how does the AI system read this paragraph and then answer the question? So let's look at some of the basics. There are word embeddings in, that, in the paragraph. So each word is there. We generate a vector for it. Just as you heard in the algorithm that Jim was describing, we generate a vector for each word in the sentence. And then for each part of speech in the sentence, we again generate a vector. Uh, we generate vector for the named entities in that passage. So with these vectors that are generated, these are the input vectors, we then do an encoding. That's called the hidden state. So there is an encoding for each of the vectors at a given time. Now um, it pass it is then taken into uh, account that at time t, whatever the previous encodings were there for t minus 1, all of those would be factored in. Because if you look at paragraphs, each word that comes after is dependent on the previous words. So we have to, again and again, in a recurrent fashion, take into account what the input vector is at time t, what is the hidden state, which would depend on the previous hidden states. And then the decoding happens. So both the passage and the question are taken through a gated recurrent unit. And we have the vectors v1, v2 through vj that represent the passage as well as the question. And then it goes through an attention layer. So think about human uh, attention. At a point in time, we look, focus on something uh, at a time. Like, suppose I want to focus on this bottle because I'm drinking water from it. So this is my point of focus. Similarly, we tell the AI system that you have to pay attention to this particular word at this point in time. And that is called the attention layer. So it will give weightage 
for a particular input word to generate the output. So that helps in it being smarter. It's not just doing one-to-one -one, uh, encoding and decoding. It is also applying attentions to it. And then we chunk those inputs and rank them. So ranking is just um, uh, taking the feature vectors and giving importance to what should come higher than the others based on the domain expertise. So domain expertise also comes into play in AI systems. So this is essentially a quick high-level overview of how reading comprehension happens in a true AI system. So let's uh, see a little closer that how the uh, encoding and decoding is occurring. The x1, x2, x3 are the input vector representations for the words in a sentence, and they are encoded into the hidden states h1, h2, h3. At each point, the hidden state is an accumulation of the previous hidden states. So h3 would depend on h1 and h2, so that we are paying attention to what happened before in the sentence and not just doing independent calculation. And then the output decoding vector is uh, comprised of y1, y2, y3. So this is a very um, quick look at how the uh, RNN, rec recurrent neural network, encoder and decoder work. So uh, here is just a quick example. Like we were, we had a sentence in French, and uh, we wanted to translate it into English. How we paid attention to each word that was coming in. So uh, you would see uh, each word is a either a, a rectangle. So when we have to take two words at a time to pay attention to two of them and then generate the output, we would be doing so because of the attention layer. So for example, in French, it is la serre, uh, if I'm saying it correctly. So that those two are taken together to produce the English translation Syria. So that's how the attention layer superimposed on the encoder-decoder layer produces the translation. So machine translation is a very typical AI uh, reading comprehension problem. I'm sorry? Yeah, it uses the structure. Uh, sure. So the question is, does the AI system use the structure of the text? That is the structure in the paragraph, yes. So what happens is that we don't just look at the words in a sentence, we also do sentence level encoding and decoding. So both the word as well as the sentence level are being taken into account through the RNN encoder decoder, attention being applied to it before we rank them and then produce the out target sequence. So, so the question is, how does this happen in a paragraph? So that's what is going on in a paragraph is, in a paragraph, you take each sentence, um, divide it into the words, individual words. You take the words through the encoder, decoder, and then take the entire sentence through the encoder, decoder, and superimpose those two. And that's how, sentence by sentence, you would take the entire paragraph. So the question is that paragraph is typically about uh, some subject. So um, and do we uh, reduce our attention to that particular subject? The answer is yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, one has to reduce their attention to what is contained in that paragraph and assign weightages because the AI system has learned through models, and that's what you saw in the feed-forward propagation and in the backward propagation, that the model training has happened. So when any real-time input comes into an AI system, it applies that model training to just pay attention and assign weightages to the words 
and the sentence as they pass through the encoder decoder. So, um, any questions? Okay. So, uh, how does an AI system compare to human reading comprehension? So, uh, we evaluated looking at the strict accuracy of comprehension and the relaxed accuracy. So, um, the deep learning done by Watson uh, that I was simply describing in high-level terms, it, it falls in between the human performance and a system that simply uses the linguistic features just as the dialect, the slang, uh, the patterns in the English, um, in, the, in any paragraph, not just English. So uh, if you take a machine learning system, a very typical convolutional neural network system, combine it with linguistic features, the accuracy uh, for is in the first row, but if you take a RNN, that is recurrent neural network, and um, test the strict and relaxed accuracy, you will see it falls in between the human and the uh, traditional machine learning system. So those are some of the benchmarks. So let's go on to something more interesting, not just reading comprehension, but also looking at the knowledge that is there in, in our text and reasoning on top of that knowledge. And definitely in natural language. I mean, that's what AI systems are about. We want to work in natural language. So um, here is a system that is using the attention weights and um, coming up with deep semantics. So what is happening here? Um, there is a question, how does having a pool in your home add to your home uh, insurance premium? So uh, many of those uh, who may have pools uh, may be having this question. How does AI system deal with it? It'll take the paragraph and highlight everywhere pool is mentioned, but on top of that, it also look, does inferences and says that if there is a close neighbor to that house, it, that would increase the premium. So this is the inferencing that is happening because of recurrent neural networking along with paying attention. So um, it has been trained to uh, in make inferences. We'll, uh, let's dive deeper into that. Uh, OK, so I think, um, OK, um, all right. So um, this, again, uh, the, um, uh, the graph here is showing how two-way attention is allowing you to give more accurate answers even when the answer length is higher. But I'm seeing that may possibly, uh, I am not, OK. All right, so uh, this paragraph, as I said, is showing that even if the answer length exceeds up to 200 words with the fact that we pay attention to uh, the ta input sequence, which in turn lets us produce the target sequence uh, more accurately. So without paying attention, just like a human does to uh, re a reading, we would not be able to give accurate answers that are longer in length because for an, it's a machine that is reading the text. How does that machine really give you accurate answers for longer and longer lengths is a uh, task in itself. And that's what with this paragraph says, that with two-way attention, we can produce longer answers accurately. OK, so let's combine what we just now discussed. In the beginning, we spoke about reading comprehension, and then we spoke about reasoning. How do we combine these two? Uh, here is a paragraph given that talks about a player who won three different games. But some of the games were national, and others were international. And then in some of them, he was the player, and in another one, he was just the manager of the team. 
So this is just a paragraph. The AI system reads it, and then what happens? It generates a, gra uh, a knowledge graph out of it where the player is there, how is it related to the different games, and were those games played in which country. So a knowledge graph from this paragraph is generated, and it is curated. So um, we then pass that graph through our um, recurrent neural network and generate the target sequences for it. Okay. So if you were to just do the reading comprehension, what you would get from that is the player won a particular game as a player and a particular game as a manager. If you were to look at the knowledge graph, you would know that that particular game was in a Spanish league and the other two were international games. Now you combine these two. Okay? Uh, Okay. So you use multiple sources for your reasoning. You use the reading comprehension and the knowledge graph for your reasoning. That's how the AI system looks at it. And when it combines the two, then it is able to answer that question. What international championship has the player won as a player? Right? When it, after combining those two, then it will know that the particular game, two, uh, 2002 uh, game, was an international game, and the player was playing in it. So that's how an AI system would give you the answer. OK, then the third part comes narration, because nothing would be complete if the AI system cannot talk to us in natural language, right? So that's our expectation. Now, how does that happen? We first summarize. For first, we do abstractive summarization. Now, what is abstractive summarization? There is a summary that is called extractive starting with an E. So extractive is simply you extract words from passages and give your summary. Whereas abstractive summarization is you take the paragraph, you need not choose all the words that were in that paragraph, you do your reasoning and give a very good summary using whatever words you need to use. So that is abstractive. And that is, again, built on the same system as the reading comprehension. How does that happen? So earlier, we spoke about uh, generating an input vector for your input words, for your parts of speech, for your named entities, for your term frequency and IDF, inverse document frequency. What are those? Term frequency is how many times a term happens in a paragraph. And inverse document frequency is how many documents refer to that particular word. So we generate input vectors for all these three, uh, all these uh, five. And that forms our input layer. It's taken through an encoding. That is our hidden state. And then we produce the target output. But before we do that, we also encode the sentences. Just as the question that was asked earlier, we are encoding both the words as well as the sentences, applying the attention weights to it. So uh, for example, the attention says, the second input word should be weighted very heavy to produce the third target word. So the second input word is being used to produce the third target word. That's how the attention mechanism comes into play. And then you produce your output. But while producing your output, the decoder also has pointers. So one is G, which is the generation that we just spoke about. But the other one is P, which is pointing back to the source document. So when it points back, it picks certain words from the source document in the summary. So that's how we are doing the abstractive summarization. 
It is hierarchical because it uses the words in the paragraph and it uses the sentences. And of course, it is encoding, decoding uh, RNN with a pointer network. So let's take some examples of how this happens. So uh, this is a source text that was given. Now the best summary that a human would give is that man charged with British backpacker's death confessed to crime, uh, the police officer claims. So that's a human summarization. Whereas the AI system says, man charged with murdering British backpacker confessed to murder. So this is what Watson produced. And similarly, you see another example, right? So uh, that is how abstractive summarization happens. So here is another document. And when you look at the journalist summary and compare it with what AI or Watson system did, Watson did use a new word that was not in the input text. So. Um, that is, how, that is the power of the AI system. It is getting closer to how a human would summarize any text. OK, so uh, there is also a good article uh, by a very uh, famous journalist is that IBM Watson does learn how to summarize well. OK, so uh, yes, I am running out of time. So uh, in the summarization, what the AI system would do is generate points for salience, how prominent a particular word is, how, how it relates to the content, what is the novelty of each word, what is the position, and then generate a recommendation. So that's why this particular uh, para summary is really highly recommended based on those features. OK? So uh, that's so the key takeaways are that language is critical to AI. Understanding, reasoning, and narration is very important. And the question and answering systems that we build, they truly can evaluate an AI system. So that's the key takeaway. I did want to dive into speech to text and text to speech, but I think we are running out of time. Um,